We have here joining us today uh, Ron Ritter, who is a partner at McKinsey in their manufacturing and supply chain practice, a topic that's very dear to my heart. Uh, in terms of uh, format, uh, Ron will introduce our very special guest today, and then we'll both take turns uh, asking questions. We do have an opportunity for the audience to ask questions later on, so please keep your questions prepared. We'll get to that in a little bit. Ron, over to you. Great. Well, we're really grateful to be here today, and I, I have to start off by saying that as an alumni of the science side over there, I honestly never, <laughs> it was never in my trajectory plan to be sitting here today. Um, and I've come here from a roundabout way of a PhD and a few other crazy things, but, but I'm uh, honored to be here today. And I think the point of this is that, you know, there's a lot of attention in Florida now. It's a very dynamic, increasingly international uh, at, at every level community. And there's a tremendous amount going on with the migration of business and the reshaping of the economy. And so as we have these sort of forums and discussions thinking about world leading, CEOs and other organizational leaders, we also need to remember that, my, that Florida as a state is a home to an increasingly large cohort of distinctive global leaders. And I think that's the point of this discussion and this series is to focus on the great leadership and innovation that we do have here in Florida, increasingly so, and I would say increasingly the envy of the world in many ways. So I think today it's a real pleasure to have uh, Josh Weinstein with us, uh, CEO and Chief Climate Officer at Carnival, which is a title that I think says a lot for us. And I think, Josh, you've come up through, through the ranks in the cruise industry of, of on the finance side, uh, running the Carnival UK brands, which is an important uh, part of the portfolio overall. Uh, Chief Operating Officer, running all of the functional capabilities and, and carrying the organization in many ways, being a big part of that team through all the fun we've had in the last 24 months uh, with COVID, which as we know is, has hit this industry particularly hard uh, in ways that are obvious to us as potentially uh, customers, but also when we think about the thousands of people that are on those ships as crew who come from all over the world with their own very special challenges of of making it, quote, to work uh, in that environment. And you have these large asset intensive industries that need to run. And I think Josh has you know, been a key part of making that uh, survive. And we still have a Carnival Cruise Line, which I think is substantially sailing now and out in the world. And that's a, a great tribute. So and then moving on now to the, to the CEO and chief climate uh, role. So I think we're very grateful and, and welcome, Josh. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much for having me. I'm very, uh, very excited to be here. It's only about two months in, so, uh, so let's just jump in. There right, right, let's start. go. What do you want to know? <laughs> Good, what do we want to know? So um, let's talk about that. Uh, so you take over from uh, Arnold Donald. Mm. Uh, Arnold Donald, by the way, for uh, those of you who saw him, he was part of our other leadership lecture series uh, a couple of years ago here on campus. So for those of you who are here, you meet the best and brightest right here on campus. <laughs> Sorry, my apologies for the plug. Um, <laughs> But tell us a little bit about your roles uh, within the company and what brought you to where you are today. Sure, sure. So I, um, you left a little bit of my career out. So I didn't start in finance. I was, uh, I was an attorney. Um, at, sorry. Yeah, I, I apologize. Um, that was I was deliberate. Uh, I, was, uh, I, was, I didn't know anything about the cruise lines, actually. I was, I was an M&A lawyer in uh, New York at Skadden Arps. And I, uh, and I had been doing that for a couple of years. And I met my, my wife in uh, college, university, and she's from Guatemala, I'm from New York, and we actually knew we'd end up in Miami. And, uh, and I, I didn't really find the thrill of being an outside lawyer. I didn't like advising other people on their things and then walking away. I wanted to be part of a company, build something, and have that vested interest. And I didn't know how to do anything else, though. So, uh, so we moved to Miami and I did the same thing down here at Greenberg Chard for about, uh, about eight months and really wasn't finding that sense of satisfaction. And there was a newspaper uh, want ad. Uh, Carnival was looking for an attorney. And it might be the last person who found a job that way. <laughs> it, might, it might be. It was, I, I actually, I still have it. We were moving houses and looking at old papers and throwing things away and I had actually saved the want ad. Uh, and so, uh, so I put my I put my resume in um, on a on a Thursday, and I expected to not hear anything anytime soon. The next day, the general counsel calls me. He says, "Can you can you get in here to interview?" 
And I said, well, sure, any, any day next week uh, so I could prepare. Uh, and, uh, and he said, no, can you come in today? Uh, because we, we're gonna make an offer to somebody else and we wanna talk to you first. And I tried all this stalling and, and, uh, and he said, no, I need you today. I said, listen, man, I know nothing about your company and I know nothing about cruising. And frankly, it's, a, it's Friday and I'm in jeans because it's casual Friday where I work. And, um, and, uh, and You're still in jeans. I'm, I am, well, now, now I can control, now the, you can, you control can. the dress code. Um, so, so he laughed and he, and he said, come in. So uh, I, I did, I interviewed for two and a half hours and um, at the end of it he said, you know, the, this is the offer we're about to make to somebody else. And he told me the, the number and the number was, uh, was 40% less than I was making. Uh, but, you know, I was pretty miserable doing what I was doing and, and I said, well, I think I'd take that. And he said, well, you got a new job. And then I said, oh, <laughs> I, gotta, <laughs> I gotta check with my wife because that is a big drop. And um, so I talked to my wife and she said, do it. This is going to make us happy. And so within a week I was there uh, and it was exactly what I, what I actually didn't know I was missing, right? I got this sense of satisfaction from understanding what we do, what we bring into the world and being a part of a team that really can make a difference. And I thought I knew all about it and I thought I was satisfied with it. And then I went on my first cruise. And uh, it was about four months into my career and I went on and I saw, you, you mentioned the crew members on board, I yeah. saw what we do. And, and I saw that, that we literally, we just bring happiness and create, create happiness uh, for people. Um, a lot of companies can say that, uh, but the way we do it is by delivering unforgettable and I would say much needed vacations um, for guests, give them a break. Um, treat them special um, and, and make, them, make them feel good. And, and I've, I saw that, it was, it's more than 20 years ago now, and that's really, no matter what my job was, being an attorney, then being, a, they asked me to be treasurer, which is a whole nother funny story, and then, because um, I have no economics, finance, or accounting in my background. Um, but every job I did, you can draw a line to what you do and the reason why the company needs that in order to be able to deliver on its purpose. And um, yeah, fantastic uh, backdrop to being able to have a long career. That's a wonderful story and we're glad you're here. Uh, I'm glad you took the 40% pay cut. Yeah, me too. As it were. <laughs> me too. So, uh, <clears throat> so let's talk about your leadership style. So, you know, we've heard people say you ask a lot of questions. Mm. Uh, that can be quite annoying. So how does this style work? <laughs> yeah. How do people like working with you? How did you develop this style? And uh, tell us a little bit about it. Um, so probably be because of my career path, you know, when I, when I went in-house to, to do law, it wasn't that big of a jump. Um, so I was fairly comfortable hitting the ground running. But then Every time I, I took on something new, something different at Carnival Corporation, you know, when they did ask me to become the treasurer, they really did understand I didn't know anything about being a treasurer. I mean, I really didn't have that in my background. I did some finance support for the CFO and treasurer. So their expectation was I needed to learn as I went. Um, and so asking, you know, I kind of had a get, a get out of jail free card, you know, I'm like, oh, sorry, I got to ask these questions because I don't know it. And, um, and it just kind of, it stuck with me um, from, you know, 15 years ago to, to today that um, I know I, I'm, I'm well placed in that I think I ask good questions usually, most of my questions I think are good. Um, and I also know I don't have the answers. Um, I'm, what I'm really looking for is to understand whether my team does, whether they need help, whether they need resources, whether they need, you know, what kind of support they might need so that we can get to a better place. And so the questioning, um, it's just naturally how I've grown in, in, the, in the company. Uh, that's the Socratic method, so. Uh, uh, awesome. Yeah, I'm a former lawyer, so I guess I can't yes. you know, <laughs> beat that out of me. So uh, Arnold talks a lot about your leadership through the global pandemic and how that was a key crucial thing in uh, getting Carnival through that phase. So talk a little bit about 
what it felt like to be in that situation and what helped you get out of that? So, so that was, uh, it was a, it was a, you know, hindsight probably gives you a better answer than at the moment. And, you know, for, from March of 2020, when they asked me to, they asked me to come back in March of 2020 from the UK when I was uh, leading Pino Cruises and, and Cunard. And ostensibly what they asked me to do was help, help the company focus on preserving cash. Uh, it was the beginning of March, it was right before we shut down, and we knew that the CFO, uh, who actually is the guy who asked me to become the treasurer 15 years ago, um, he was gonna be really busy focusing on financing, focusing on you know, filling whatever needs we had in the capital markets. And so with my background, you know, please come back and look inward and focus the company on what we needed to do to preserve cash any way we could, just be, be thoughtful about it. And from that moment on, you know, we call it a, you know, it was, it was emergency response, right? I mean, it really, for, for months, uh, it was emergency response mode, which is not a good thing to be in. Um, normally when we have a, when we had a ship crisis, when I was, you know, running things in the UK, you set up an emergency response um, organization for two days, three days, and then it, goes, shifts into, okay, crisis over, now carry on. This was literally months of crisis. And, and, and it was because the crisis kept unfolding as, as we went. And so, you know, I, I can't, it, it's hard to, it's hard to, it's actually probably hard to put in words what I feel like we accomplished um, as a team. And my role in it was, was certainly to help coordinate and, um, and, with nine brands, a uh, hundred ships, a hundred thousand crew members, you know, we needed to be coordinated and we needed to make sure that we were all moving in the same direction. But, but what we were able to accomplish by, you know, just in the wind down of getting 300,000 guests home, getting a hundred thousand of our crew members home, even if their countries were shutting their borders, even to their own citizens. And, and when they, wouldn't let us fly people home because of the borders closing. We said, screw it, fine, we're, we're sailing to for the Philippines. We are sailing to India. We are sailing to Indonesia, and we are bringing these, these folks home. Um, getting through that, getting through understanding how to optimize uh, a, a pause. We called it a pause. It felt like more, I, I, my, my mind, it was a hibernation. But without knowing how long will that last, um, you know, we, you know, I talked to some other executives in the, in the industry, um, and we get along pretty well, and, you know, we all kept count of how many scenarios we ran, um, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's ludicrous, right? I mean, it's just ludicrous. So we did the best we could um, to make sure that we'd be able to get out the other side whenever that would be. Um, and sometimes we took, you know, risk, um, sometimes we played it more conservatively and we made decisions. We made it as a team. Arnold set up a, his leadership team, which was myself, the CFO, chief maritime officer who reported to me, and then the global heads of our operating companies. And at the beginning of the pandemic, we were meeting every day. Uh, and that, that was not normal, obviously. And that slowly morphed into three times a week, two times a week. Uh, as we were able to to steer steer through, but it was it was that need to get everybody um, aligned, and uh, and and ideally in agreement. We didn't always agree, but you know we came out unified. Very cool. Uh, so you spoke about your C F O. Yeah. Uh, is this someone who's a mentor to you, who's guided you through this? Because pulling you out of legal and putting you in treasury. Yeah. Seems like the kind of thing you'd want your mentor to do. Uh, yeah, he is so, so he is an amazing man. His name is David Bernstein, who some of you might know. Um, he's been the CFO since 2007. And uh, when he, he, he went on a global search for, uh, for a new treasurer, and, and I didn't think about it at all. And um, after a month, I, I went into my boss's office, the general counsel's office, and I was like, God, I gotta pick that. Treasure. This is driving me nuts because I'm making decisions and I shouldn't be making the decision. And he said, "Well, maybe you should. You know, 
David, David and a couple other people, they, they think maybe you should apply. So I, I went to go talk to David, and he said, uh, we talked a lot about it, and I'd supported him in the past for a few things. And, and this came up several times in this process. He, he said, and I told him, I don't have this in my background. He said, yeah, but you went to Penn, right? And I said, yeah, political science, not warden. <laughs> I, I went to liberal arts. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and so he knew what he was getting into when he asked me to do it. And I was in his office 15 times a day asking him questions, him teaching me uh, how to be a treasurer. And over the years, he increased my responsibilities as treasurer and tax and insurance and financial planning and analysis. And every single time he did it on the basis that he truly wanted me to grow. Um, and it was helping him. Uh, it freed up his time, obviously, so he could focus on other things. But he, uh, he's a, a great example of, of somebody who takes mentorship um, um, as, as part of his job, as part of his job. So do you see yourself as a mentor now? And how I, you are you know, helping I, others? I, it's a crap answer, because I'm not as good as he is. Um, so, I, so yes, I, I do think it's important. There's several folks who I've worked with quite closely that I do try to spend um, more time, not just on the job, but on the bigger picture and, and trying to help their careers. Um, but I've, uh, seeing the dedication that, that uh, somebody like David puts in, I think that's a poster child that um, I'm just not as good at as, as he is. Yeah. Good. You know, I, there's a lot in that conversation about culture and leadership and people. And I'm wondering now, we're, we're two and a half years out of that, that fateful march in 2020. There's been so much turmoil in the organization in terms of departures and changes in roles and recovery. How do you take the organization out of crisis and recovery mode, and how do you think about talent in this new brave world we're headed into? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So on the first part, um, on how do we shift? So what I've been saying, actually, so I took over on August 1st, mm -hmm. and um, one of the things I think we had to, I, I don't, it wasn't uniform, but we, we, we didn't publicly within the company say, right, we're done, right? The, the return to service is done uh, and we need to now shift to a return to strong profitability because that's what we were and that and that's that's how we ran ourselves mm. and so that's been um, something that I've tried to revolve the narrative around for the last couple of months and and we we can help in that process by refocusing on running the business I wouldn't say the way we used to because it's everything's changed right um, but Things as simple as putting out the right um, uh, financial reporting again. Um, you know, basically stopping some of the ad hoc things sure, that we had sure. built up over the year. You know, basically over the two years to say, you know, let's let's readjust uh, and let's get back to focusing on what matters most for us to be able to take all of the, you know, oh. Over two years, over this pause, over this, over this restart, we, we, we displayed, you, there's so many adjectives you could use to talk sure, about yeah, what yeah. our team has done and how they've done it, right? I mean, the, you know, there's obviously dedication and determination and perseverance, um, but there's also, there was creativity and yeah, innovation yeah, yeah. and agility and nimbleness, but all of that was always in response to an external force, sure, right? Whether that was yeah. regulation, whether it was the virus itself, whether it was politics, you, you name it, we were pivoting because we had to, because something was forcing us to. Yeah, yeah. And we're actually at this point now where we get to take that skill set, yeah, yeah, right? Very interesting. All yeah. of that creativity and innovation yeah. that we utilized and refocus it inward and say, right, how do we now just you know, really burst forward um, and, and use that strength yeah, yeah. To, to our advantage now. And has that affected kind of talent strategy as you think about how you incentivize and reward, evaluate, hire, retain? I mean, all the way down even yeah. into the frontline ranks. Yeah, so with respect to how are we evaluating the talent, look, I mean, we've, we've, we've put people into roles now um, that that wasn't their career path. You could say a lot of examples of, 
taking somebody like me as an attorney and throwing sure, it into sure. a treasurer role. We, have, we recognize talent for what it is and say, you know what, you, you'll be great at anything. Let's try you on this uh, and let's see you develop a completely different skill set, mm -hmm. develop as a leader. You don't need to be looking just up and down in your space yeah. to be able yeah. to progress. So I think we're doing a better job at that across the corporation. Uh, we, we're constantly looking at our, our compensation um, philosophy, right? And what sure. do we need to do to make sure that we are, A, giving people what they need, um, you know, to check the box, but then incentivizing them the right way. And candidly, you know, over the last two years, it's been so volatile, we have changed. You know, every single year, mm. we've taken a, a bit of a different approach based on whatever that reality is. And we try to do our best to, to make sure our, our folks are incentivized. Yeah, interesting. And so do you think you can preserve that culture of innovation and agility? I mean, that would be remarkable, right? What it a would gift. be, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Talk about silver lining, I, right? I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> um, you know, I think we, you know, we are still, we are, despite the fact that from a capacity standpoint, we're probably pretty similar today versus where we were in 2019, mm -hmm. before the pandemic, we're, we're a little bit smaller, but we quickly are actually going to be up when you, by the time you get to next year. Um, our shoreside uh, team is about 15% smaller uh, than it was in mm. 2019. So we got through all of that with all that innovation and creativity with a smaller team. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I think that, that that has served us well and I think it's gonna bolster us for the future. Um, I, as I say to, to the team, you, because of all that skill set, you're really marketable. We want to make sure you stay with yeah, us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm selfish, and we want you using That's that using point. that skill set yeah. for uh, for for this company. And and frankly, because of where we are, there's a lot of upside at the company. We're still, we're, you know, we still got 36 billion dollars of debt, um, and our market cap's about 10 billion dollars. And you know, before the pandemic, the ratio was a lot more flipped. Yeah, uh, yeah, and yeah. so there is opportunity for us to uh, to really see this through getting back to where we need to get back to kick off free cash flow pay down debt and and rise up again great great okay good so um you talked about capacity getting back on track operations across the board across industries have had lots of disruptions thanks to supply chains uh you know i often joke that Nobody knew about supply chains <laughs> until things started going wrong. I mean, supply chains were humming along perfectly. Yeah. Nobody knew the chief operating officer at all. And then suddenly one thing goes wrong and everybody <laughs> starts blaming the supply chain. So yeah. my rant aside, uh, talk about supply chains, uh, how they're affecting your operations now and what you see as future. I mean, we just saw yesterday in the journal about Nike cutting inventories, you know, the bullwhip effect going across mm -hmm. the entire supply chain. So. What, do you, what are your thoughts on that? How is it affecting you? Yeah, so it's, um, you know, the pandemic, yeah, so many different avenues you can take into our company and, and what, what it meant to us and then how we had to manage it. And, you know, we were dealing with a company that started, you know, pretty, um, I don't know, uh, regimented in an approach, in a way of working and always looking for opportunity to improve. But we knew every single ship would sail full. Right? That was our, that's, that's the way we did that. We knew pretty scientifically how much of each type of thing we would need on board the ship because everybody gets on on this day, everybody leaves on that day, and we know exactly how many people there's going to be, give or take a few. And so for us, first of all, you, know, you take the guest out of the equation, you're left with 100 ships and no guests. What does that mean? Right? What does that mean for our supply chain? What does that mean for our relationships with our vendors? Um, what can we do to think creatively with them about figuring out, A, what we need and what we don't need and what we don't need, how can we still make it a win-win for us and our, and our vendors? And sometimes it worked and sometimes it, it didn't work and that's mm -hmm. the reality that we were facing. Um, then as we were getting back, that was almost easier than restarting because when you restart, <laughs> I mean, good Lord, like, the, you know, nothing yeah, went yeah. according to plan all the time. I mean, it, this was, it was a volatile situation. So as we restarted and as we had our planning restarts and we, you know, you know, when you get to scenario 482, right, you know, I, the, yeah. that volatility made us have to think differently about how we manage our supply chain, how we manage the sourcing, um, volumes we can commit to versus what we just have to, you know, 
wing it, uh, for, for lack of a better way to say it. And, and that's where the risk taking came in versus playing it more conservatively. And we didn't have a philosophy, right? It was like, let's just think about this. Mm -hmm. Let's figure out what makes the most sense for on a ship basis, on a brand basis, on a regional basis, based on what volumes we might need, where we think we'll be most successful in our restarts versus where we might hit some more bumps in the road. So, so that, that caused us to just have to put more agility into our ways of working than we otherwise would have. And, and on, e even with that agility, you know, the, there was constant disruption. Um, we're not receiving the things that we ordered, we're not receiving the right quantities, we're, you know, and, and it was the interaction between the sourcing team, the supply chain folks with the operations got a lot stronger, actually, mm -hmm. because, you know, everybody realized this, this was nobody's fault, right? This is the reality of yeah, yeah. the world that we were living in, and in that reality, we just got to roll up our sleeves and say, all right, fine, so how are we going to deal with it? Uh, and, and I think the teams, they recognize in each other strengths that they didn't know really needed to even be flexed and where we just had, you know, gaps that we had to figure out together. So I, you know, I wouldn't want it to keep happening that way, but, you know, there is some good that comes out of, of any crisis. Yeah, absolutely. I think the crisis has helped teams bond together, uh, understand each other's skills in ways that hadn't happened before. Absolutely, yeah. 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 You know, I, I think a question we have to ask now is about digital analytics, you know, the future of big analytics, digital twins, all these things that we speak so much about. But this is, from a customer point of view, almost you could say an inherently analog experience. I actually want to get away from all that. But behind the scenes, I suspect there's, there's a big digital future ahead for you. I mean, maybe talk about that. Yeah. So there is, um, I, well, as a, as a premise, I think you're right. I mean, I think one of the things that we really try to lean into as an experience in creating that happiness is letting people live in the moment right. a little more right, than right, they right. tend to, you know, when they're, um, when they're going through their day-to-day -day and they're multitasking and they're, they're getting pulled in a lot of directions. The key for us is how do, we, how do we use technology in a way that enables what we do but doesn't make technology the thing that people are looking for in the experience. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And so... We, I think we're doing a we're doing a pretty good pretty good job on that. You know, using data to understand a how do we get folks on the ships to begin with, right? How are we generating the right leads? How are we targeting the right folks um, who are going to uh -huh. resonate with the brand that we are trying to put them on? Which is step one, because if you don't get that right and you get yeah, you know yeah. the wrong folks on the wrong brand for whatever reason, it's not the right experience because every single cruise line offers it in a different way, uh -huh. you know, you kind of screw up at the starting point and maybe they'll never come back. So, so using, using the data from that mm -hmm. starting point is really quite important. And then understanding the proclivities on board, um, what they want to spend their money on, what they don't want to spend their money yeah, on, yeah, yeah. And, and figuring out how to put the right things before each guest. So we're catering to them. Um, with respect to other types of technology, I think we've done a, we've done a pretty good job of uh, accelerating a roadmap that all of our brands had anyway to reduce friction. And the reason why I say accelerate is because if you remember a year and a half ago, um, maybe even two years ago, nobody wanted to touch anything. Mm. If right, you remember right. what COVID yeah, yeah, was, yeah, yeah. we had to wipe down our groceries. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the concept of contactless payment and you don't sure. have to sign a check, it, you know, all, yeah, we, you know, some yeah, of our yeah, brands yeah. were doing it, some of our brands were not. You know, we, we sped a lot of things up uh, on the technology yeah, front sure. um, out of necessity. Uh, but then we also saw the benefit of, mm -hmm. of what we were doing. So there is, um, it is the future. Uh, it, it, you know, the, the concept of, of using, it's, it's here, uh, it's our future as far as using, using AI. I do think um, we, we just have to make sure that we don't lose sight of what's most important. And for us, the thing that's most important is delivering the experience on board um, and making sure that we are taking people to the right places, that the crew mm -hmm. members are, um, are having great interactions with these guests. Um, that the food is great. Yeah. We don't need, you don't need technology to make good food. Right, um, right. You know, I mean, we have to make sure we don't lose sight of we get the basics right. Um, and that, frankly, is my first priority. Make yeah. sure that we're always clicking on getting the basics right. 
Yeah. Do you do you think that the organization every level can? I mean, how do they learn that AI? Let just just take the extreme example. Is your friend that this is actually going to help you, yeah. whether you're a cook in the galley or an executive, to do your job better yeah. versus a threat and a competitor or something strange? I don't think I don't think we have that problem. Okay. Um, I, I truly don't think we have a problem where anybody would look at. In, in, in our industry, on the front lines, I'm not really worried about that. We, no matter what technology is going to do, we need our crew yeah, teams yeah, on board, yeah. um, full stop. From running the ships, because you know, I won't be in this role by the time we're running those ships without people. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, so <laughs> well, you know, so I'm not I'm not worried about any yeah. type of conflict. And I think uh, I think our people actually benefit a lot from the technology we introduce to make their jobs not go away, but more efficient. Okay. Let them focus on the right things and take away some of the pain points that they deal with. Now, as far as um, us, I, th I think the biggest question for us is how do we prioritize, mm -hmm. right? Um, some of the things that we can take advantage of in the digital space are relatively you know, easy to do, not complex, and it goes all the way up to incredibly costly and incredibly complex. And given where we are and all of the things we want to push forward with, we just have to make sure we prioritize the right Sure, way. sure, yeah, okay. Yeah. So I was very uh, taken by the title that you have, you know, the CEO and then this Chief Climate Officer. Uh, tell us about the genesis of this and tell us about what sustainability means to you personally and then to the organization. Sure. So the so the title uh, comes from we do uh, as Carnival Corporation we do a lot of work um, uh, for risk planning and scenario planning on climate change. Uh, now we're we're doing that probably ahead of most companies in the U.S. because we're also listed in the U.K. Mm -hmm. uh, and for TCFD reasons, you know, we need to make sure we've got robust processes um, and planning in place for that. And so we started this a um, bit over a year ago. And um, as, as part of that process of understanding, excuse me, from a climate change perspective, not only what is our impact, right, and what can we do to reduce the impact, which we've been doing for a long time, and I can talk about that, but also, well, let's think about the world in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, what is the climate? like change impact on our business and how is it that we're making decisions today that will set us up as best we can hope for for being able to thrive in whatever that that climate change scenario is and so that's been pretty it's been interesting for me it's been eye-opening for i think for a lot of people as we as we you know you don't have to go crazy but you come up with a a scenario where the world's maybe trying to limit that climate change impact to one and a half degrees to the four degree and what does that mean for us what does it mean for our business what does that mean for our ability to 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 operate mm -hmm. and um, and so as we went through that process what also became clear is we can have a committee we can have a process but ultimately there needs to be somebody in role who will make decisions what comes out of that risk scenario mm -hmm. and risk mm -hmm. analysis says right this is what we're going to do in response, and, and this is how we're going to move forward. And Arnold took that role um, when we established it last year, and you know I think rightly so as a CEO. And so it it, uh, it passed to me. Uh, so I'm so to answer your other question, as far as sustainability for the company, um, you know we have we have brands that are based all over the world: uh, Germany, Italy, the UK, Australia, here. Um, you know, this is something that all of us um, understand. We won't have a business if we don't do our part and stay ahead, right? And it means something different in Germany today than it does here. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more acute in Germany. It's more top of mind with the regulators, politicians, yeah, and communities. Sure. And so we've been working very, very hard over the last um, I'd say 15 years, to, to have a roadmap of perpetual improvement uh, when it comes to our impact on, on the earth. Now, given what we do and what we are, it's carbon, right? And reducing our carbon footprint is probably the biggest impact that we can have on, on doing our part. And we have, 
we actually peaked our absolute carbon uh, over a decade ago, despite the fact that we're about 25% bigger today than we were a decade ago, and that's because we are getting better at building more efficient mm -hmm. ships, introducing technology to retrofit onto um, older ships, itinerary planning, you know, driving a ship's like driving sure, a car, sure. go mm -hmm. shorter distances and slower and you're gonna mm -hmm. use less uh, fuel and, and introduce more, uh, less carbon. So we've, uh, we've set uh, new targets because uh, we, we beat our 2020 targets by a good amount. So we had set new targets to get our carbon intensity down by another 20% by the time we get to 2030. And um, there's somebody on our sustainability team who's smiling. She could do this better than I can. Um, and uh, I, I, my goal is actually to blow through that because I, I think we can. I think we've got good, um, good teams focused on the right things, and, um, and I think we'll make it headway. And it's not just carbon. Um, it is it's food waste. Sure, uh, sure. It is consumption, right? I mean, it's thinking about everything in the environmental space that we yeah. can do to reduce our impact. We have done a real good job of, I mean, just smashing the amount of single-use plastics we have on board yeah. by a 90% yeah. um, versus pre-pandemic levels. We are um, actively trying to reduce our, not just the food waste, but actually the consumption. They like put less on, yeah. Yeah. on the ship, figure out how to manage it more efficiently, yeah. um, and you'll produce less waste. And then we do it cleaner because we have food digesters on every single yeah, ship, yeah, yeah, which yeah. is like a, literally, it's a metal stomach <laughs> with, um, <laughs> <clears throat> with bacteria living on peach pits. Mm -hmm. And you, you can put the, the food waste in and it yeah, creates yeah. a clean effluent that um, you, we, could, we could theoretically put food waste into the ocean depending on what the regulations are, but we choose to do it this way because we think it's sure, less impactful sure. for the environment. So, I mean, just to ask one follow-on on that, and I, and I suppose we should go to some questions, but yep. climate change and sustainability, because it, the business requires that it's regulated or it's necessary for the future, but also what about distinctive positioning in the market of actually saying that we're going to out-compete for the customer of the future because they'd rather sail with us? Yep. I mean, is, how does that figure in? So, um, you know, I, I want to be, be thoughtful about not competing on the environment, health, safety, and security. I, I, I think it's, um, we, want to, we want to be at the top of all of that. We yeah. want to be at the top of our sustainability efforts, but I think it's a fine line um, between being able to be the good citizen, being able to use that um, to our advantage because we sure. know consumer tastes are going to dictate that we do over time. Um, but I think as an industry, that's one of the things where I'd rather not compete Interesting. if I don't yeah, have to. Yeah, I, sure. I think we'll, we'll win if we keep doing the right things and others don't keep up. Interesting, very good, good. So um, just as a quick follow up on the sustainability angle, um, how does it impact your employees to know that they are part of a unit that is committed to this level? I mean, are they, I mean, we keep hearing about the next generation of employees wanting to be part of purpose-driven organizations. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, is this helping you attract more talent? Is this helping you retain talent? I, I think, I don't think we will have employees in five to 10 years if, if we don't, um, I, I, I don't. So I think this is not just, look, there's three reasons to do it. One is because you want the guests to keep coming. Two is because we gotta have folks who wanna work with us. And three is because I have three kids and I want, I want right, them right, to, right, right, to right. enjoy this planet for their lives and their kids' lives. Um, and so I, I think that there's, there's, those are the three principles that are yeah, gonna drive us nice. forward. That's great. So we can open, out, open it up to questions from the audience here. So I see a couple of questions here. Let's start with the student here, if you, go, you guys don't mind, Luis. Well, I, I, don't, I don't think it's a secret because I'd be making it up um, because it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't exist. No matter what anybody tells you, it doesn't exist yet. Um, but, so, and, but I do think that when we think about what the ship of the future is going to be in 20 years, 
we're not planning on a world where we'll have found the answer. Uh, what we are planning on is a world where there'll be multiple, um, multiple things that we can utilize that will allow us to be net carbon you know, neutral. Um, and that will be a combination of number one, which is probably still the most important, at least right now, keep figuring out how to reduce consumption, right? That, that's always got to be the starting point. The one thing that we can control is how much fuel we use. So if we can be smarter about the itinerary setting, if we can be smarter about how we manage our HVAC systems, introducing technology to reduce consumption, that is going to be principle number one that all of the ships continue to get built around. On top of that, I, the way I probably want to say this, it'll be modular, right? You know, we can already plug in to shore power on how many ships to land? Do you remember? Um, over 40% of our fleet. Over 40% of our fleet, uh, which is about 92 ships right now, uh, can plug in to uh, the electric grid whenever they get into a port. Now, that's more ships than ports that have that capability yet, but there's plans in place around the world to increase that. So that will allow us to plug into a grid just like you know, UM campus right now. On top of that, we are using um, fuel cell technology that we're, we've been trialing, um, batteries, you know, all of those things will play its part. Uh, methanol is probably gonna be, at least in the, in the medium term, something that will we're going to try to see what the impact can be. So it, it'll be lots of things that we will then have to make sure we're building a ship that can accommodate different technology over time. And that, that is how we're thinking about the building process. Um, thank you, Luis. Uh, to the lady here. Uh, I think there's a mic there in case. Okay. You know, yeah. Thank you very much. I would like to ask you about um, the women in your team. Mm. So, and uh, that's one and the other one. What are you doing regarding diversity and inclusion? Sure, thanks. So, uh, so women on my team. So I have, I have six direct report. I have twelve direct reports, and six are women, um, and that includes uh, two women who run two of our four operating companies, and which represents over fifty percent of our global capacity. And they're amazing, uh, and they're. Uh, um, we have great leaders. Uh, on top of that, I have um, a woman who runs our strategy and global port development group, our communications, our global HR officer, and my chief of staff. And um, I would say part of that might be a little bit of a coincidence, and part of it's because I think we need to actively try to um, engineer at, at a top level uh, diversity. Um, that doesn't mean we're going to do something um, stupid. Um, we want to make sure we have competent people, but we want to make sure we have competent people that reflect the society in which we live in. And so I think that's on us as leaders to make sure that that's part of our thought process as we fill positions, as we grow people. Uh, we do it in a way that we are reflecting society. Uh, and the great thing is, so that's at a, at a top level, so we have, we have about 110,000, 120,000 employees uh, around the world. Um, and we're probably more diverse than most uh, because we source our teams from, um, I'd say, almost 100 countries. Uh, it's like the UN on every single yeah. one of our ships. It's remarkable. Uh, it, it is. Um, so we, we get people in. Uh, both genders, uh, nationality, ethnicity, religion, and it's amazing. What we need to do is make sure that we are creating career paths that develop all of them should they want to spend their career with us so that they can all excel and grow over time, and we're very focused on that. We can do a better job of making sure that the top quartile of our company looks a lot more like the other quartiles of our company. But that means we got to do it by bringing people in and raising people up. All right. Over to you. Thank you. Well, good morning. Morning. Uh, after 2020, I mean, all the cruise lines ended up with a significant amount of debt in the balance sheet. And right now that we are getting back mm -hmm. into kind of a normal, uh, we have a recession looming, right? And yeah. historically, the recession impact. Uh, 
the disposable income of families that impacts tourism and, uh, and hospitality spending. Yep. How do you see the short term and medium term on the industry? Do you see any opportunities for consolidation, concentration, mergers? Hmm. Well, I'll start by saying when I was a treasurer, we only had 12 billion at that. Uh, <laughs> I, like, I, <laughs> I, like, I like to tease the current treasurer, who is uh, also a woman and is amazing. Um, and I, I, I then quickly tell her my job was so much easier than yours was. Uh, um, so, you know, I, to, to answer your question on consolidation and merger, I don't know. Um, you know, if you ask, if you ask me, um, you know, how are we all going to manage the debt burden uh, that we're dealing with? You know, to me, we've got to get back to the cash generation that we did. Uh, I can speak for us, cash generation that we did. Uh, and use the free cash flow to pay down debt. We, we are not building as much as we used to. You know, we were maybe four ships a year uh, entering into the pandemic. After, um, I think we've got two ships in 24 and one in 25, and that will, that will probably be what we're looking at as a company, and we will gen we'll, we'll utilize all that excess free cash flow to pay down debt. The, um, I'll, I'll leave the mergers and acquisitions one alone. We have nine brands. Uh, we got plenty to do, uh, and we've got to we got to focus in work. Right. John, um, John Zayas from the management department. Uh, good morning, and thank morning. you for joining us. Uh, my question relates to how you sort of manage these ships uh, during the pandemic, and in particular, uh, you mentioned the need for cash, but at the same time, the ability to update these ships and do. I, I imagine pre-pandemic, you were hoping for a time that the ships would be idle so you could update them, but I would imagine the cash wasn't really there. <laughs> you got it. Yeah, that's, um, I, there was several times that I reflected over the, the pause that, yeah, this is perfect timing, but not, um, because you're absolutely right. Um, you know, we, we, didn't, we didn't have the capital to do what you'd love to do with an opportunity like that. So what we did was we managed every single ship on the basis of how do we make sure the ship is safe, compliant, we're gonna protect the environment, protect our people, um, and we gotta go on life support. That, that's what we have to do. We, have, you know, we were using the term cash burn. What's our cash burn? What's our monthly cash burn? And unfortunately for us, we were the biggest by far cruise corporation in the world and that's great when you're up and running in full and it sucks when you're not operating yeah. uh, because it's just a larger pool of cash burns so we had to be um, very very thoughtful in how we we manage that and um, and that's that was the reality now when we the interesting thing is because it took so long to get out of the pause I mean some of the shows it was almost two years Every single ship, pretty much, I might be overstating it, but almost every single ship did go through a dry dock um, before getting back into operations. So we did have the opportunity to do a few things, not, not too much fun stuff, but get some stuff done before each ship went into operations to make sure that she was gonna perform well. Um, but yeah, those are the breaks. Yeah, the student there, Oh, okay, go ahead first. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Jairo Aguilera from ProColombia. Um, last Monday, we started our uh, cruise uh, season in Cartagena de Indias, receiving the Carnival Spirit. Around 2,000 passengers enjoyed our culture in Cartagena. It's some, something amazing for in our industry. And my question is, as, as Carnival Corporation, what are you waiting about the destinations, what we should implement in order to, to offer better experience for cruise lines, for passengers. What, what are you waiting for, for, uh, for, for that? What am I waiting for? Um, well, I, I guess I'll answer it by saying, what are we looking for in, in, our, in our destination partners? Yes. Um, you know, we, if you think about it, our, you, you have the, the destination partners have the ability to showcase themselves, right? 
So first question is, what is that destination going to shine with? Is it the beaches? Is it ecotourism? Is it shopping, right? The, every single destination has the ability to lean into what they do and do authentically. I, th I think that's the first, first step. Second is, you just have to have the infrastructure. And sometimes we can help with that. Um, do we have enough capacity to handle shore excursions for all the passengers that might want to get off and, and experience something? If not, we need to make sure that that's going to exist before we can commit to really going into a destination in full. So it's usually, it's a partnership um, with the destination, understand what their capabilities are, where their gaps are, um, and we figure out whether we can make that fit. Uh, it's got to be, you know, we have to make sure that not only are we going to be successful for the long term, but the destination is too. Otherwise, it won't work. So if you have, a, if you have specific ideas, we can talk. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. thanks. I think. Uh, Caitlin, I didn't think this was. You need to. Uh, no, I had a little more. It was 9.30. I had my okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, it's a quick question. Um, <clears throat> as a consumer, as if someone was looking to go on a cruise as a family, what makes Carnival Cruise brand stand out above any other cruise brand? So specifically, so you're picking on one of the nine, just so we're clear. So it's only one of our nine children, right? Okay. Carnival Cruise Line, but I can do that. Um, I so, meant like in general of your companies, what makes you guys in, yeah. as whole stand out above? Well, I, but I think you're right. You, you have to ask the question based on a brand. Um, because even within our company, we have a portfolio. And what we don't want is two brands catering to the same people, doing the same things. So, so that's the right question, right? What is any one of our brands going to do so that it resonates with the target audience that it is seeking? Okay. So Carnival Cruise Line, they're America's cruise line. They are fun. They are boisterous. Um, they are the kind of cruise where you go into the main dining room, you have your table, and then you start leaning over and talking to the people at the table next to you. Um, people are outgoing. Um, they are looking to... Um, they're looking to enjoy their holiday in a, um, in a loud way. <laughs> That's probably the best way to say it. Um, and they have fun. The, uh, that, that is a stark difference than um, some, you know, if you, if you go on to um, uh, Seabourn, uh, which is our ultra luxury cruise experience, you're not going to experience that at all. Uh, now, here's the thing. Um, that doesn't mean um, if you're rich, you should go on one. If you're middle class, you should go on another. It's what is the experience that you're looking for. Um, you can characterize me however you want, but we go on a cruise a year, uh, and other than the three years that we were living in England, it was Carnival Cruise Line every single year. Uh, my kids love Carnival Cruise Line. They love going in the water park. They love going up to that frozen yogurt machine and just putting their face on it. And, and I just have, I. <laughs> they get in trouble, but they don't care. Um, so that's the experience that, that we as a family have really enjoyed. Um, so so that's, that's the key. So the key for me when I came into the role uh, is I want to make sure that every single one of our brands is incredibly tight when it comes to who are they, what do they stand for, what is their experience? How do they communicate that experience? Are they, ex are they doing it to the right target audience? Um, and then are, are they delivering on whatever it is that they're gonna promise to, to, that, to that audience? Because if we, if we do that right, that will, that will help us as a, as a company. All right. uh, we have time for one more question. Yes. You have another one. Hi, I'm Barbara Shred, and by the way, I worked for Royal Caribbean Group for 20 plus years, so I know a little bit about the industry. Um, but I'm doing consulting now relating to new builds and some other things. What is Carnival's strategy regarding LNG ships? Because you, you, know, you can't convert for a reasonable price, so having to do with new builds. Yeah, so, um, so LNG is, you know, to my point, when we were talking earlier about the ship of the future, the... Um, the best we got right now um, to be powering the ships with as little carbon intensity as possible is, is LNG, especially for ships the size that, that we've got. The, uh, to your point, 
at least the way we see it right now, it's not cost effective to try to retrofit. So we, we as a company, we've got, um, I think when all is said and done, we'll have 11 LNG ships. Uh, and because of the size that those ships are versus the rest of our fleet, that will actually be about 20% of our global capacity will be powered or, or capable of being powered by LNG. Um, when it comes to the rest of the fleet, it's really what I was saying before, which is we're, you know, probably like Royal and like the other cruise companies, it is always a, a, a process of how can we improve incrementally the fleet, right? What are the, what are the technologies that we can introduce to um, make our, like I said, our HVACs more efficient, coat the hulls with silicone-based um, paint that literally cuts through the water quicker, reduces uh, friction, right? And so you're going to have to use less uh, fuel. We are uh, putting uh, air lubrication systems on many of our ships, not just the new builds, but we're also looking at retrofitting, which literally sits on the bottom of the hull and it produces air bubbles. And when you're going at speed and you're doing it on a bed of air bubbles, you reduce the friction dramatically and you reduce the amount of fuel you need to consume and you reduce the carbon in, in the process. So we're, we're, we really do look at everything that we can and then just figure out from a cost perspective and, and the benefit perspective what, what gives us the most bang for, for the buck. I think the lady here had one last question. Uh, last question is, um, looking into the future, uh, which are the three things that keep you awake at night? Like, what worries you? Looking into the industry and the future of the company, what keeps you awake? Uh, I hate these questions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, you know, I have, uh, haven't been here for 20 years, and I, I mean, I don't want to be flippant, but I became the treasurer in November of 2007, and that was right before all hell broke loose with the financial crisis. Um, they sent me to the UK when they just voted for Brexit, right? Um, they brought me back here as COO when the pandemic started, um, and now here I am as CEO, um, and we're, you know, we got a lot of work ahead, right? We've got $36 billion of debt to pay down, but um, what I've seen in my career, and specifically over the last two and a half years, um, you know, there are external things that will happen to us. Um, potential recession, as, as, um, as one of the other questions uh, were stating. Um, pandemic might not have gone away, who knows, right? I mean, you know, we're all hopeful. I just, I just feel like with our team, you know, we, we pivot, we understand, and we move on, and so, I don't think much keeps me up at night, to be honest with you. We'll, uh, we'll try to manage anything that comes our way as best as we can, but I do think whatever it is, it's external that will come to us as opposed to something that worries me on, about our underlying business. Yeah. yeah, very good. So I think this has been a great discussion. Um, let's hope the next two years is dramatically better than the last two for the industry. And I think we all appreciate the time. And I think as you've described it, the industry is really at the center of society, right? In terms of people coming to work, people taking their experiences, the center of climate change and technology and so many things. So, so thank you for being here and very best of luck. Well, no, thank you very much. Yeah. I appreciated it. Thank you, Josh. Uh, very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank